When I looked at my notes and it said the first word was soddy, I really, <laughs> I wondered maybe I should, why should I should start with an insult. But it's actually a, a, a reminder that Frederick Soddy, was, who was a chemist, and he may have appeared here in about 1926, Nobel laureate, turned his attention to economics. And what he said was that an economy is embedded in energy, material, and information flows. This is 1926, and we're still trying to catch up with that. As was said earlier this morning, many of the things that we talk about are not exactly new, but they are being repackaged, represented, reinvented, re re-everything, I suppose, for today's age. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Now, I just want to make four points. Uh, I'm working with Walter this afternoon, so we're both going to do a number of fairly short points, because what we really want, because the key word of the day is feedback at the top. What we'd like is your questions, your prompts. So some of these things I come out with might be a little bit spiky. But that's the idea. We want to see where your, where your thinking is, where you think the challenges are, where you think perhaps we haven't gone quite in the right direction. So feedback, why does that matter? Well, if an economy is embedded in energy, materials, and information flows, it's very much a question of flows. And hence the, the title of the book, A Wealth of Flows, because we perhaps need to think of things less as a machine with input and output, as much more a metabolism with continuous transformation. And somebody suggested that it, using the word metabolism wouldn't exactly appeal to business folks, or it might not appeal to business folks. But that might be because some people haven't really thought about it quite as much as they might have short, thought about the linear machine input, throughput, output time model. Because if there's one thing that's for sure in the, this part of the 21st century, is that we've entered an era in which we've recognized that most real-world systems are nonlinear. They're full of feedback, the top word there. A circular economy is nothing more than an economy with more identifiable and actionable feedback loops. In the linear economy, the only really circular bit about it, or a spiral if you want to play with it, is the money cycle, the, uh, the production of goods and services and exchange of money, the circular flow of income. But the circular economy itself in, in full flow would include not only the circular flow of income, but the, the work we've been hearing about on materials or on energy. So it's all three. It's a little ironic sometimes, but some people seem to think that the circular economy is, well, that was a linear one, and let's just talk about energy and materials. Well, that's only talking about part of the economy. What happened to the information flows? The primary one is money, debt, credit, and all the rest of it. So in the end, we will have to talk about a circular economy, which is about all of the three flows. Because if it's circular, if it's full of feedback, and it's supposed to do two things, one is rebuild natural capital. Well, it's supposed to do more than just two, but two key ones are restoring natural capital so that we have a possibility of more flows. And if everything is food, we don't do the waste is food thing anymore. If everything is food, everything is transformed, If everything is food and everything is transformed, then we are talking about having effective flows of these materials. You know, the, the next thing is the next thing and the next thing after that. So talking about metabolism isn't particularly difficult because it's continual transformation, fueled by the flow through of energy, which at the very least can be clean, but should ideally, I think, uh, mean a shift towards renewables. So we have energy flowing through, material cycling, and a money system that makes sense. Uh, a money system that makes sense, by the way, would be one which, in which the flows were continuous, mostly around enabling the, the bounty of a cradle-to-cradle uh, -cradle inspired production system to be affordable, if available, and continuous. My next word on the, the, the minimalistic slides, I hope you approve of the, the minimalism today, is dynamic. All nonlinear systems are dynamic uh, if they endure. And uh, enduring means that there's a balance of positive and feedback, positive and negative feedback. And this, this is not simple. All enduring dynamic systems depend upon having the right systems conditions to enable them to endure. 
And the task, the hardest task there may be in the circular economy is deciding what those system conditions are. In design, cradle to cradle and other related ideas have really helped us with that. Industrial help, ecology helps us. But that doesn't tell us what we should do about a number of other elements. But the security we have is in knowing that we are part of the change that is coming because it is all part of a 21st century enlightenment which is built around the recognition that all real world systems are non-linear. They're complex, not just complicated. They depend on appropriate system conditions, not random regulation and interference. You should only do what you know would lead to, or at least uh, be able to get a result you could deal with. And being an iterative system full of feedback, we're going to have to continually adjust it. Now, this is some of the insights from understanding nonlinear systems. You can't just set it and stand back. You have to participate, and we'll get to that in the last of my four points. The second point I want to, to mention is this one that I originally saw, uh, I think, from Rocky Mountain Institute. At least I've given that credit in case anybody feels like shouting at me. Abundance by design. This is by intention. This economy is by intention, not by accident. And um, part of that abundance is realizing that it's a whole systems change. Now, that's easy to say. But some people say, oh, well, isn't the circular economy just lots more recycling? Well, most people know that recycling is fine, except that it doesn't change any business models. It's still essentially throughput, but you do it because contemplating what you would, you would have without doing it is even worse. But it's not just recycling on steroids. It's not just one thing. And that's probably the hardest part of a circular economy for many people, is that they, they struggle sometimes with knowing it has to be, OK, everything is food. We need to make sure materials flow in appropriate uh, biological and technical cycles. They, they might get the renewable energy thing. That's fine, uh, or at least the shift in that direction as, as far as possible. But they don't necessarily add in, well, what about the sharing economy? Access over ownership? That probably has to be in there if we want to make sure that products in the technical cycle are used uh, with as, as long as it's necessary or as long as there's high value in doing that, but not just needlessly extended product lifetimes. So there's all of those things added up to start with. So there's access over ownership probably for big durables, uh, shift in that direction, more intense use of assets anyway. Uh, an excellent um, um, presentation this morning on all of that. I learned more things in 12 minutes than I'd, I'd, I'd learned reading about it in the last uh, two weeks. I hope everybody else had some of that sort of realization. So access over ownership, uh, everything is food, shift towards renewables. But what about some of the enabling conditions? It's a systems conditions thing. You've got to talk about some stage about taxing and spending. Uh, I, I first learned this from Walter, that uh, we need to perhaps tax shift. Why, we, why do we tax labor? Why don't we tax non-renewable -re resources? So if we don't get a tax shift, you'll be leaving the incentives towards substituting uh, machinery and energy for people. So that might happen. And what about subsidies? Why do we subsidize below market price some forms of energy production, for example, as many others? Why do we subsidize fishing, which uh, enables fish to be caught that in a market, in a market situation, wouldn't be caught? So the whole thing has to happen. So it's not necessarily an emerging trend, but it's just a realization that unless you want to talk about all of it, there's not much point in talking about one little bit, unless it's a starter, of course. But if you don't talk about it all, it's not going to happen as a whole. It's going to break down. So you need the three flows. You need money. You need energy. You need materials. And you also need to be able to look at the relationships between all three. Just to finish off, I've got two quick things. Again, derived largely from cradle to cradle. It's got to be effective, not just efficient. And I took a, a point from Gunter Pauli some years ago. He said it's not just about lowering costs. It's about people's ability to add value. Uh, for communities to add value, to be able to get more income, to be able to buy the wonderful products that we're now designing, or to get access to the, 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 the stuff that we want. So it has to be the complete loop again. So income and expenditure have to, have to be in an appropriate relationship. So just cutting costs 
doesn't do it because the old idea that the rebound would lead to all the employment you need isn't working out anymore. And what we want in the end is a democracy that works. There's nothing more antithetical to a, a democracy than scarcity and fear and uncertainty. The original flowering of democracy, if we don't talk way back in Athens and whatever, but in the more, in the more Western societies, a lot depended upon the first enlightenment. A lot depended upon income and, and wealth becoming more distributed. A lot depended on people being able to have the time to get involved as citizens and to have a vested interest. Now, what I think the circular economy offers most of all is this opportunity to rebuild the democratic tradition because it helps create more prosperity within a, a system rather than force an increasing division between those who have and have not. And therefore, a circular economy is perhaps a safety net for society as well as a very good economic and business idea. Thank you very much.